ultimately, I think what I'm sharing with you, Austin, is that what does the Coptic Orthodox Church have to offer? Well, it has to offer that idea of being truly thankful and faithful in everything, concerning everything, and for all things, regardless of what comes. And I think for those of us who got a little bit too comfortable with our ideas of what it means to be, you know, a North American young man or woman, a North American parent, people who live with the security of what we call democracy, um, we fail to realize that the government is on his shoulders. Our trust is in not is not in anything or anyone else or any other worldly system. Our trust is in him alone. And I think the Coptic Church can help remind people of that. Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin and this is Gospel Simplicity. It's a, a place where we seek to bring simplicity out of theological and historical complexity. Today is a much requested interview that has been a long time in the making and today our topic is Coptic Orthodoxy. It was an absolute pleasure to host Father Anthony Murad to talk about Coptic Orthodoxy, both the history of it, the Council of Chalcedon, and how that first schism in the church took place between the uh, Orthodox Catholic Church and the Oriental Orthodox churches, and I was able to learn a lot about that. I think you will as well. But then, I'm biased, but I have to say, be sure to stick around to the end, because that's when we get to talk about Coptic spirituality and what we can learn from the Coptic Church, specifically through its experience of persecution, both historically and in the present. That blessed me, and I'm quite confident it's going to bless you, so be sure to stick around for that. Hey, I do want to say real quick, though, a thank you to my patron subscribers and merch buyers who make this channel possible, especially to my patrons who give monthly to keep this channel going and growing, supporting not only the channel, but me, so that I can take the time to make these videos. Thank you all so much. If you want to see this channel continue to keep going and growing and reaching new people and allowing me to continue to keep doing it, go to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. And one last thing before we get to the video. I know, I know. But I, it's a great time uh, to give a shout out to Katina Bible. They formerly sponsored this channel and they were the ones who went ahead and uh, set me up with Father Anthony Murad for this interview. So grateful to them and they're not paying me to do this uh, any longer to give them plugs. But uh, seriously, check out Katina Bible. They do great stuff. You can uh, use their app to get commentaries from the church fathers as you read scripture. So free plug for Katina Bible. Thanks to those guys. With all that being said, here's the interview. Well, today I am joined by Father Anthony Morad. Father Anthony Morad is a parish priest at St. George and St. Anthony Coptic Orthodox Church in Ottawa, Ontario. He is most well known for his work on YouTube through Coptic Orthodox Answers, and I will tell you he has the patience of a saint, as this is approximately the fourth time we've <laughs> recorded this intro due to technical difficulties. But here we are, and I am excited to have him on the channel today, because today we are talking about Coptic Orthodoxy, a, a topic I've wanted to cover for a while now, and I've, I've read your comments telling me, hey, when are you going to talk about Coptic Orthodoxy? And to all of you people that watch this in the future who have asked that question, here is the video. And so, Father Anthony, first of all, thank you for being here. And second of all, for those that aren't familiar and they're saying Coptic Orthodoxy, I've heard of Eastern Orthodoxy, but, but what, what is Coptic Orthodoxy? So Coptic Orthodoxy, Austin, is basically, it, it's, it's the Orthodox Church of Egypt. Uh, we are proud to say that we are, you know, the originally founded apostolic church that first came to Egypt by the evangelist and apostle St. Mark. Um, so we're part of the Oriental Orthodox family. The Church of Alexandria that you read of, you know, in the very early church history is very much the Coptic Orthodox Church. The church that was founded by St. Mark, the Church of St. Athanasius, the Church of St. Cyril the Great, uh, the Church of St. Anthony the Great. So we're very proud to find our heritage and our tradition very much rooted in that apostolic church that was founded in Egypt in the very first century. That's wonderful. And it's extra wonderful that we got through a whole question and it's all working. So thank you so much. Uh, you, you mentioned a word there that I think people might have heard of before when you said that, that we are part of the Oriental Orthodox Church. To give people just um, a, a sense of the landscape of Orthodox churches, um, wh what are the Oriental Orthodox churches? Is that synonymous with Coptic Orthodox or is Coptic Orthodoxy a part of the Oriental Orthodox Church, 
And in which case, what are some of the other Oriental Orthodox churches? So if, if you know a little bit about church history, in the very beginning, there, there seemed to be, you know, four and then five main churches that presented themselves as you wish, if you wish, as like the hubs of Christianity for the first almost 400, uh, 400 years or so, right? Um, now, the Church of Alexandria was one of those key players, if you wish, a great hub. And that, you know, the, if you've ever heard of the great theological school of Alexandria, um, that was very much, you know, the church that the Coptic Church finds its roots from. So when we speak of Oriental Orthodoxy, we are speaking of the six main churches that, you know, had a disagreement when it comes to the outcome of the Council of Chalcedon and left um, the rest of the churches because of the schism that was caused because of the disagreement in Chalcedon. And among those, obviously, uh, the lead church, the church that is honored as first among equals, uh, is very much the Alexandrian church. The other churches are obviously the Armenian church, the Syriac church, the Eritrean church, the Ethiopian church. So those, the six churches that are there, those are the ones that are called the Oriental churches, and they're all equal churches, but the first among equals would be recognized as the See of St. Mark, which is the Alexandrian or Coptic Orthodox Church. All right, that's really helpful, and I hope that people are starting to kind of get a handle of what it is we're talking about here. And we're going to talk about uh, Chalcedon in a bit here, because I think for some of my more theologically inclined guests, that might be kind of the, the hot topic for them that they're really interested in trying to make sense of here as kind of a point of division. But before we get to that, that point of division and that kind of historical demarcation point, I want to kind of get on the ground level a bit and talk about the Coptic Orthodox liturgy. Now, a lot of uh, people that watch this show will probably have either been to an Orthodox church or have some familiarity with what's going on in an Orthodox liturgy. And if they, if you were to take that person, blindfold them, which hopefully this you know isn't getting too dark there for them, uh, and no pun intended, well, that's, that's the kind of night it's going to be, but, and y you put them in a Coptic Orthodox church, would they, would they know the difference? Like, if I was to sit through a Coptic Orthodox liturgy, never done that, hopefully will one day, but I've sat through an Orthodox liturgy, would I essentially just think I'm in any other Eastern Orthodox church, or would it be significantly different? No, definitely not significantly different. Um, very much the same meal, just a different flavor. So oh, what, I, what, I, what I want to be able to describe as, you know, it, what's beautiful about a lot of the apostolic churches, uh, and specifically those who identify themselves as Orthodox, you, you'll notice that what ends up happening is that there really is the same experience for the believer when they participate in the divine liturgy. The difference is in the expression, not the experience. So obviously our hymnology is very different than the Byzantine traditional uh, hymnology. We're very melismatic, so we love our long tunes. Our liturgies will last, you know, on average pro approximately two hours with the distribution of the mysteries. The focus is still very much the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is, is the climax of the divine liturgy. You'll still have almost the same divisions. The offering, you'll have the liturgy of the word, you'll have the liturgy of the faithful, and then the distribution of the mysteries. You'll even notice that if you attend um, if you attend within the Coptic Orthodox Church, we typically pray the liturgy or the anaphora that is associated to St. Basil the Great. Now, oftentimes in the Eastern Orthodox Churches, they associate their anaphora, or the most commonly prayed one, to St. John Chrysostom. What's really interesting is when you put them next to each other, there's entire passages that are word for word the exact same thing. So that's what I mean by, you know, same meal, just maybe a little bit of a different flavor. It's there really is the same experience, but very much just a different expression. That's all. I really love that metaphor of same meal, different flavor. That's a really handy way of putting that and also talking about the at the level of experience um, mm -hmm. being the same. I, I think that's really, really helpful. So this is probably the most like Protestant question to ask, but I hear two hour service and I like how long is the sermon in that? Because if I went to a two hour service, it would be because the preacher has just been going on and on and on. But like, how, how would that be broken up? Just completely out of curiosity. It's actually funny that you mentioned that because in our two hour services, there is no homily. That's fascinating. <laughs> so, okay. So if you were to typically come on a Sunday, so in our, let me give you an example for our parish, right? As much as possible, the, the priest always wants to be able to, to offer 
you know, that word to the people who have come in to attend. Because we pray multiple liturgical prayers throughout the week, um, what ends up happening is that usually the homily that is prepared for is the one that is on Sunday. So our Sunday liturgy is scheduled from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. It's three hours, right? And within that three-hour period, there is approximately a 25 to 30-minute sermon that is given there. The rest of the time is prayed because we're really taking our time with all the hymnology, with all of the responses. We sometimes choose an anaphora that's a little bit longer. And this is something that you're going to notice that is very Coptic. <laughs> we're very, very influenced by the, the monastic movement. So I need you to put yourself in the mindset of the monastics. The monastics have already consecrated themselves to want to be able to spend their entire day in prayer. So when you speak to a monastic who is consecrated and who lives for prayer and who lives with the intention of being able to connect with God, it is very normal that you see them want to spend an entire evening in vigil when it comes to prayers and praises. It is very common for them to be able to add beauty and a certain level of expression in hymnology where they elongate this period where they're offering praise. And so because Egypt is a very monastic, um, the Coptic church is a very monastically inclined um, group of faithful, what happens is the monastic movement really influenced us. So the way that the monks preserved the divine liturgy throughout the entire era of specifically persecution in Egypt, uh, that was imported into the city. We took what they were doing, their three-hour services. There's actually, and, and please like, <laughs> don't be too shocked when I say this, we have an anaphora that is associated to St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Gregory of Nazianzus. And if you pray it with its proper tunes, it's a six-hour liturgy, and, and it's absolutely mind-blowing. It's absolutely beautiful, but for the regular, for the laity, I mean, they'd kill us if we made a six-hour liturgy. So we stick to St. Basil, we do two hours, and that includes, you know, the offering as well as the, off, the offering uh, of incense for matins, as well as the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the faithful, the distribution of the mysteries, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, we like to take our time in prayers. Hey, that's beautiful, and I love the connection with monasticism there as kind of one of the unique, uh, again, flavors of Coptic Orthodoxy. And for those that are familiar with church history, I mean, it's, and you mentioned, I believe, Antony the Great um, in the beginning there, but it, it's, into, it's out of Egypt and, um, that we see the, the Desert Fathers and those first monastic movements. So it's, it's very interesting to see how that shaped even the liturgy. I, I have a follow-up question with that, but I while we're on this subject of the potential of six-hour liturgies, I, I do have to ask that the first uh, Eastern Orthodox liturgy I ever went to was in a fairly traditional parish insofar as they had people stand the whole time. Is that part of the Coptic tradition? Would, would people be standing for those six hours or are there traditionally pews? I, and I know within the Eastern Orthodox Church, though there might be some that stand today, most sit. Is, is, how does that map onto the Coptic experience? So in the most authentic of traditions, if you go back to many of our monasteries that are still very well populated today with monks and nuns, um, most of the churches you won't find any pews. Uh, but whenever we moved the church into the cities, we imported the idea of the pews. So the pews are there. So if you were to come into my parish here in Ottawa, there's pews for people to be able to sit. But I want to tell you that approximately 80% of the congregation is standing. Sorry, the congregation is standing for 80% of the time. The rest of the time, the pews are actually used for whenever there are readings, whether it be the Pauline epistles, the Catholic epistles, uh, the readings of you know, the Acts of the Apostles, um, or whenever the homily is being given. Uh, but other than those periods, you're either standing or you're worshiping, you're kneeling, you're in a, a mode of prostration, if you wish. So for the vast majority of the time, even though the pews are there, they're not being used to its uh, full capacity, if you wish. You know, it's probably a very shallow, superficial uh, level of interest for my part that I find these things fascinating. But as someone who grew up in a church that was so different than that, that was my, my uh, original church, which would have, no one would be more surprised that I would come out of that church and then be interested in conversations like this because it was very much the non-denominational, seeker-sensitive, mega-church style thing where it's like, how do we get them movie theater style chairs and fog machines and get them out of here 60 minutes flat like that was right. kind of the environment i grew up in and so part of the joy of getting to investigate all these things is just 
realizing what a narrow expression of Christianity that is and what a profoundly modern expression that is and being able to see just the, the beautiful ways that the church has worshipped throughout the centuries and then begin to question maybe how that, that works on us and, and what that tells us what worship is um, as we do that. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to answer what may be a bit of a, a silly or shallow level question there. Um, Not at all. Not I, at all. I certainly I'm... appreciate that. I want to tell you, Austin, honestly, I don't think that's shallow at all. I actually, uh, I wish more people took interest in those little things because they're not little. And, and they actually, they express something super beautiful for those who are actually looking to understand the depth and the wealth of, you know, the expressions of the Holy Church. Um, posture in worship is not something to be taken lightly. So the fact that you're asking that question I think it, could, could, that could pro- we could spend an hour just talking about posture and worship if we wanted to, but let's not. But let's just say that I don't think your question is silly. It's no secret that today, perhaps more than ever, people are struggling with their mental health. I think if I asked you all to virtually raise your hand and said, hey, are you currently struggling? Have you ever, do you consistently struggle with mental health, be it anxiety, depression, or whatever? I think many of us, myself included, would raise our hand and say, yeah, like things get hard sometimes and sometimes it feels like more than we can handle. But the problem is despite facing these difficult circumstances and dealing with these mental health crises at times, so few of us end up actually getting the help that we need. It might be because it can take so long to get into a counselor or therapist or you think it's going to be too much or maybe there's this thought in the back of your head that Christians aren't allowed to have mental health problems. And does that mean there's something wrong with me? Well, from the beginning of my channel, far before it had any type of reach or influence, I have wanted to help do my part to help end that stigma. That's why one of my first videos I ever made was titled, You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. Hoping that that would give people the permission to go out and get the help they need without being worried about these shameful stigmas that people have attached to it. Well, now I am so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling, who is who are leading the charge in helping people get the help they need. Rather than having to wait months to get into a counselor, if you sign up for Faithful Counseling, you can be paired with a counselor in 24 hours or less. I don't know if you've ever attempted to do something like this through traditional avenues, but if you have, you know just how crazy it is to be able to pair up with someone that quickly. All of their counselors are licensed and have over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with them in flexible ways. You can do uh, video sessions, phone calls, uh, private messaging. It is really fantastic. They even have a live chat. It is such an amazing service. I'm so excited to be partnering with them and I'd really encourage you to check them out. We're going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do so, you'll get 10% off your first month and I think it will be really, really helpful for you. Now, I do want to say that this isn't a crisis line, and if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, I would encourage you so, so much to not go through this alone, but to reach out to a crisis line. I'll put one on the screen here. But if you are looking for mental health help, I think Faithful Counseling could be great for you. They will connect you with a Christian counselor, and I know people come to my channel from a variety of backgrounds, so if you want one specifically from your Christian denomination, they will work with you to try to make that happen so that you can get Christian mental health help. I think it's going to be fantastic for you. I can't wait for you to check it out. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. You get 10% off your first month. After that, it'll be $260 per month, but there is financial aid available for those who qualify. Once again, guys, don't hesitate to get the help you need. Faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. Well, I really appreciate that. And I imagine we, we certainly could have that conversation, though. Uh, people might be, be sad that that's how I used the entire hour I had for the first video on Coptic Orthodoxy. <laughs> but alas. Um, so you've touched on this a little bit already. And uh, this is kind of funneling back to that, that monastic question. But so the Coptic Orthodox Church is fundamentally the church uh, that was founded by the Apostle Mark uh, and that is um, that is founded by Mark and is the church out of Egypt, one of the original patriarchates, uh, one of the most influential churches coming out of Alexandria there. Um, is there anything else that people should know 
about the, the specific flavor of, of kind of the ancient Coptic church. We're going to get into the, kind of the spirituality of the church through uh, more modern times as we go through. Um, but for people, before we get into Chalcedon and talk about kind of how that split developed, is there anything you think they should know about the history of the uh, Coptic church there? Definitely. I think if, if you walk into a Coptic Orthodox church today, the way that we pray, the way that we behave ourselves, the way that we deal with community, the way that we teach, um, all of those things are very much influenced by the history that the church underwent. So obviously you, you mentioned Chalcedon, and that's a very historical moment in the church, not only for the Church of Alexandria, uh, but for, you know, for, for the one holy Catholic church, right? The universal church was affected very much by Chalcedon. But for Alexandria specifically, the Coptic Church was also very heavily influenced by the fact that, you know, just a few centuries after Chalcedon, the church went from a place where we were, you know, on very good terms with both, you know, the church and the state, then we found ourselves very much influenced by the fact that we were now a church that was living in a land where, you know, those who ruled over us were not in favor of our religious expression. You know, when the church undergoes a certain level of livelihood in persecution, it affects very much the way that we pray. It affects very much the way that we teach. And so there's there's so much that could be said there. Um, but 100%, the church, the Coptic church that you walk into today, so much of its expression, so much of the way that we preserve our heritage, so much of why it is that we're enclosed on ourselves and we're very focused on, you know, holding on to our children and holding on to them dearly and creating our own methods of education for those children, whether it be theologically, spiritually, and so on and so forth. A lot of that preservation happened under the scrutiny and the pressure of a persecuted church. And, and this is not something that, you know, only goes back to the 5th and 6th and 7th century. I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, in Egypt until today, you know, Christianity, Christians are very much the minority. And even though to God be our glory, right now things seem to be taking, you know, a turn for what is better because the state and the current leadership uh, of, of the country have taken an interest in wanting to be able to alleviate those kind of pressures. Uh, that wasn't always the case. And so because of that, you know, it dramatically affects the way that the church expresses herself. And it very much affects the way that we deal with God and how we tell people that they can you know, only put their trust in God. So when people speak of a church that is, you know, in, in, in on good terms with the government and the church is comfortable and the government supports the church, that is not what we have known for almost 1,400 years. So definitely that will affect us. So you come into a Coptic Orthodox church and you'll see very much that there's a lot of that history that has affected the way that we express ourselves, the way that we teach, the way that we behave, and so on and so forth. So I'm not sure to what level of detail uh, we should go into, but by all means, like uh, I'll leave it up to you to see if there's any questions that you feel could be more pertinent. Yeah, I think we'll definitely follow up on that as we get into what the the church, kind of widely speaking, in the most broad sense of that term, can learn from Coptic Orthodoxy, because I think there's a lot there, and I know as we talked uh, in advance of this episode, that one of the things that we were most excited, rather than just highlighting some of the differences, would be what can what, what is kind of the uniqueness of Coptic spirituality, I think specifically for our times, and I think there's um, some really interesting overlaps there that we'll get to in a second. But I, I don't want to keep the um, my, my fellow theology nerds too upset or waiting too long to talk about Chalcedon, because I do think it's an important topic. Um, and it is, seems like it would be an odd thing to have a first episode on Coptic Orthodoxy and not really talk about Chalcedon. Um, so let, let's go ahead and jump into that. So you, I think you mentioned it uh, briefly that we've got this 5th century, I think like 451 or something like that, Council of Chalcedon. What's going on there that produces this kind of one of the church's first major schisms? And specifically from the Coptic Orthodox perspective, because I I know that in the West, uh, probably the same in uh, the Catholic tradition, but certainly in the Protestant tradition, there's a certain narrative of church history. And it goes from Jerusalem very quickly to Rome, centers on kind of Western Christianity. And the way the story of uh, Chalcedon is told is very much through the lens of 
uh, Western eyes who see Chalcedon as orthodoxy and to fall away from it as heterodoxy uh, or heresy, depending on, I guess, who you're talking to there. And that's kind of that. It's kind of chalked up like, hey, this was the way you're supposed to go, and we're just going to keep going on that path. But obviously there's two sides to any story, as um, all good mothers told their fighting children. Um, <laughs> and so kind of from a Coptic perspective, when you think of that council, what do you see? And what was the Coptic church fighting for there? That's a really loaded question. So, and I love the fact that you bring up that analogy of, you know, the mother who speaks to both of her children that are fighting uh, in the sim most simplistic of ways. This really is a fight between brothers, right? Um, you cannot speak of Chalcedon within the Coptic mindset without speaking of the context of the times, what was happening even before Chalcedon. Everything stems from that council in Ephesus with St. Cyril, right? It, it doesn't just begin in Chalcedon. Everyone likes to speak of the history of what happened to our patriarch, Dioscorus, and how it is that he was excommunicated. Most people don't even know he was only excommunicated over 200 years after he died. There was no excommunication that actually happened at Chalcedon. He was indeed deposed at Chalcedon, but there was no excommunication for bad theology. The problem is that when you begin to study history in its most accurate of ways, and I invite anyone to, like, by all means, please read the minutes that were written uh, by Dr. Richard Price. He wrote the minutes of Chalcedon. If you're interested in reading the minutes, it's almost 650 pages. I read them because I couldn't put it down. Like, if you like drama, like, read the minutes of Chalcedon. Now, that is dramatic. Let me tell you, there, there's so much politics. There's so much history. There's so much context that leads up to Chalcedon. It's not something that happened overnight. And, you know, truth be told, while we cannot say that theology didn't play a part in it, the truth is that it was much more... It was much more going on there at the level of, you know, the main hubs of the churches um, having disagreements or people carrying a certain level of resentment. There was definitely politics and power involved in all of this and eventually climaxed into, you know, what happened in Chalcedon where the Oscarus of Alexandria was basically put on trial and they, he was being accused of being a monophysite, right? And to be called a monophysite is to say, basically, you only believe in one nature after the union. Um, and the good news is, is that Coptic Orthodoxy, long before um, our patriarch Dioscorus, we've always condemned um, that heresy. We definitely believe if today, see, and this is where it gets really interesting. And this is where you begin to realize Chalcedon, there's so much more going on there because today, if we sat down, with our brothers and sisters from the Catholic Church, if we sat down with our brothers and sisters from the Eastern Orthodox Church. And the only question that was asked is, what is your Christological belief? All of us are in agreement. <laughs> All of us are in agreement. We definitely believe the Lord Jesus Christ truly is, you know, the, the one who is the Theanthropos. He is the God-man. Our Christology clearly testifies to the fact that he is perfectly divine and perfectly human, one person, one hypostasis, the word of God incarnate. Remember, I mean, we are the church of St. Cyril of Alexandria, him who put the formula down, him who spoke the anathemas to Nestorius, we are his children. And Dioscorus repeats this over and over again in his minutes at the, or in his, in his speeches at the Council of Chalcedon. Eventually, and if you're looking for a book to try to understand why I'm speaking of the politics and the history, one of the most, if you wish, in my opinion, at the very least, and obviously I'm biased, I'm, I'm Coptic Orthodox, right? Uh, but if you want to read a good book that I believe is very less biased, like only speaks the truth of history, there's a beautiful book called Chalcedon Reexamined by Dr. V.C. Samuel. I, I think it's a wonderful book. It was put back into print just recently. Um, and I, I think if you can get access to it and you can order it, it's a wonderful book that will give you a really great understanding of what was actually going on, you know, behind the scenes and what led up to, you know, the, the conflict that happened at Chalcedon. So in summary, I don't think the Coptic Orthodox Church in any way is monophysite. And I don't think at all that's what was expressed at Chalcedon. If there was any hint of the heresy of the Church of Alexandria being monophysite, 
and if there was any hint of that at Chalcedon, then Alexandria would have been excommunicated on the spot. Alexandria was not excommunicated at Chalcedon. Most people have a very false understanding, and that's not actually what happened. And so because of that, the problem is very clearly not theology. The problem very much uh, is an understanding of everything that led up to that conflict. And unfortunately, the conflict wasn't dealt with properly. And so because of that, some of the churches, including Alexandria, stepped away. And then, you know, eventually it led to the anathemas that were cast onto Dioscorus, and the Coptic Orthodox Church was eventually seen as monophysite. What's really interesting also is to examine the years that happened after Chalcedon. There was many attempts of reconciliation. Why would the church try to reconcile both the Oriental churches as well as the Eastern churches and the Church of Rome? Why would we try to reconcile and find a way to come back together unless there was an underlying premise that this is not a conflict that we should allow to exist. You see, if it was clear heresy, the church was always very, like, very, very categorical on this. So, for instance, with the Arian heresy, even when Constantine suggested that we allow Arius back into the church, the church stood firm and said, absolutely not. What is wrong is wrong, and it will remain wrong, and there is no reconciliation between light and darkness. If this is the stance that the church has with heresy, and yet we see attempts of reconciliation after Chalcedon, what does that tell us? So there's so much going on there. So if you're, if you're asking me specifically what happened at Chalcedon, today, even though I have the same Christological belief as my brothers and sisters in the Eastern Church, as my brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church, if you were to tell me, Father Anthony, would you be willing then, because we have the same Christological belief, would you be willing to sign off and say that you agree with what happened at Chalcedon? I would still have to say no. I don't agree with Chalcedon because what Chalcedon did and said was not necessarily at all what people believe today. The proof of that, and again, I invite people to study this if they wish, take a look at some of the things or the canons that were put in place in the, the councils that happened after Chalcedon. Take a look at what happened in the Second Council of Constantinople. The canons that clarify the belief of the Eastern Church and the Church of Rome when it comes to Christology or how it is that they take persons like, you know, Theodore of Mopsuestia and they condemn their beliefs, those same people that were elevated and put on pedestals at, at Chalcedon. All of this to basically say, today, if you're asking the question, do we, all, do we all have the same Christological belief? I really believe we do. Do we have the same interpretation of history, specifically of what happened in Chalcedon? No, I don't think we read history the same way. But as far as the level of faith goes, I am really hopeful. And I know that many, many on each side are praying for this. We do have a very firm hope that the Lord will allow us to be able to unite in love at some point. If you're anything like me, you might have this vague sense that you should be investing, or maybe you actively want to invest, but you just find the whole thing a little confusing. I've been there. I totally get that. Between wondering what should you buy and where should you invest, who, which companies do you pick and when do you pick them? And on top of all of that, how do you know that your money isn't going to be supporting companies that are against your moral values? To be honest, it's all very complex, but that is where Christ-Centered Capital comes in, C3. C3 is an organization that exists to help you not only be a good steward of your money and be able to invest wisely by giving you timely stock picks, mock portfolios, even alternative investing opportunities like crypto and all of that and so much more, but they do it in a way that gives you ratings of these companies based on what they are supporting and whether or not they would line up with Christian moral convictions. It's amazing, so helpful, and allows you to take that investing to a more conscious level and see, is this really something that I would want to be supporting? I highly recommend you check them out, and you can do so by going to ChristCenteredCapital.com. And if you do, be sure to use the promo code C3Austin for your first month absolutely free. You don't even have to pay anything. You can see if you like it, see what kind of services they offer you. After that, it would be $7 per month, and just so you know, 50% of those profits will be going back into Christian organizations like pro-life organizations, Christian colleges, and much, much more. They're a great organization that I'm so happy to be partnering with, and again, I'd encourage you to check them out at ChristCenteredCapital.com and use the promo code C3Austin to get your first month free. 
Well, there's a lot I want to follow up with there, and I'm going to try to choose wisely. The first thing I want to do regards uh, some of the statements at the end, just a, a bit of a clarification. And then I, I want to maybe give some further background for some of the listeners that might not be as well read in to what's going on here. I know a lot of my people might have read a lot on this and, and they're ready to kind of go up at that level. But I also try to always be aware of the people that maybe are just getting into this and we're throwing out some, some big words and historical events that they might be not be too familiar with. I think of my grandma who faithfully watches these videos and tells me that most of them go over her head, but she watches nonetheless because she's the best. And That's so awesome. for people like that, I, I do want to maybe try to unpack just a couple of those concepts. Um, but one thing you said at the end there was that you, you believe that you hold, the, the, and the Coptic Church generally, holds the, the same faith in terms of Christology as the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. But you said, if you ask me if I agree with what happened at Chalcedon, I would say no. Specifically when you're saying that, the latter part there, is that in terms of the, the Chalcedonian definition that famously comes out there of we've got one person, two natures, without confusion, change, division, or separation? I think is how that goes there. Um, or is that, with, <laughs> I don't agree with how the council was carried out. Because I, I could see those as being maybe two different things. So let me let me share something with you, okay? And I'm, instead of answering your question directly, let me share something with you. Every single liturgy, <coughs> excuse me, let me take a sip of water. Every single liturgy before the distribution of the Holy Eucharist, the priest in front of the entire congregants, and all those who are there to participate in the mysteries, says the following prayer. It says, Amen, Amen, Amen. I believe, I believe, I believe. And I confess to the last breath that this is the life-given flesh that your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, took from our Lady, the Lady of us all, the Holy Theotokos, Saint Mary. He made it one with His divinity, without mingling, without confusion, and without alteration. He confessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate. He gave it up for us upon the holy wood of the cross of His own will for us all. Truly, I believe that his divinity parted not from his humanity for a single moment, nor a twinkling of an eye. It was given for us for salvation and remission of sins and eternal life to those who partake of him. I believe, I believe, I believe that this is true. Amen. This prayer is said every single divine liturgy. When you hear that, there is absolutely no room for the accusation of the Coptic Church's monophysite. Right? Because if I was monophysite, why would I speak of he made it one with his divinity without mingling and without confusion, without alteration? There is no reason to speak in those terms if I actually believed in the heresy of being a monophysite. So if you're asking me, do I believe in the expression of the faith that clearly speaks of the one Lord Jesus Christ, who is of two natures, divine and human? 100%, I have no problem with that. The problem, and I think this was clearly, it was clearly noticed at the very least, or brought to the forefront when you take a look at some of the declarations that were made after Chalcedon, specifically in Constantinople too, where when we read, for instance, the Tome of Leo, some of the language leaves a lot of room for potentially people to slip down into that area of, you know, is this Nestorianism? Is he sometimes human and is he sometimes divine? But when you have the proper definitions, and especially if you take a look at the definitions that were put forward in the, in the councils that happened after Chalcedon, we have absolutely no problem with those Christological definitions. So, do I agree with Chalcedon historically in the way that it was managed and the power struggle that existed and the politics that surrounded it and the desire to set aside the Church of Alexandria? No, we will never be able to accept Chalcedon at that level. But the definitions of faith that came afterwards 100% we recognize them, and that's why I think there is hope for unity there. Awesome. That's really helpful. We're going to jump into that hope for unity in just one second. But to go back a little further in that answer, <coughs> because you mentioned that you think it's fundamental to understanding Chalcedon, and I worry that maybe some people don't have this understanding, is that I believe you mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in order to understand Chalcedon, we have to understand uh, what happened at Ephesus and with Cyril. 
And some of my listeners might be like, ah, yeah, Ephesus, Ciro, got that. Others might be like, I, I couldn't tell you where Ephesus is, and was that a council, and who's Cyril? So for the people that are a little more on the latter side of that, what is, and I know there's a lot here, but maybe a, a key point of background that you would give them to help contextualize uh, the Council of Chalcedon that maybe they weren't familiar with. So the way that things went, uh, the, the, the way that basically things um, found themselves to basically happen at the Council of Ephesus were ones where um, you could see that there was the beginning of some tension between some of the heads of the churches, Alexandria and Antioch specifically, so St. Cyril of Alexandria as well as John of Antioch. There was also struggle with Constantinople because Nestorius, who was excommunicated, was you know the patriarch of Constantinople, who was a student of the church of Antioch. We begin to see tensions that exist there. And the definitions that were put forth and widely accepted by the entire church, yes, they were the ones that were put forward, you know, 12 anathemas of St. Cyril of Alexandria, even though that victory was one that was attributed to the entire church, tensions began to grow specifically towards the Church of Alexandria. And, you know, some historians describe the Church of Alexandria at the time as, you know, taking a little bit too much space, right? So politically, politically and at the level of power, historians seem to point out that, like, you know, they're, they're, as, as brothers, we're taking up a little bit too much space on the couch, and it's starting to create some tension with our other brothers. When this happens, and then there is the conflict that happens specifically at, you know, what other churches will call the Robber Council, which we call the Second Council of Ephesus, which happened right before Chalcedon. It was the Church of Alexandria that was asked by the emperor to come and preside over that to potentially, you know, put on trial Flavian. Um, so again, you, you've got to know a little bit of the history there to be able to understand how that can cause tension with Rome, because Rome technically is supposed to be the court of appeals of all the churches. The emperor didn't go to Rome. The emperor went to Alexandria. That causes tension. And again, uh, Dioscorus was the one who was asked to preside with one of his co-chairs, which was the bishop of Jerusalem. The rest of the church did not agree with the decisions that were made there because Eutychus, the heretic, uh, seemed to fool everyone who was involved. Eventually, we have a bishop, who, a very righteous bishop, Flavian, who ends up dying from the wounds that were inflicted on him by, you know, the, the guards that were taking him as they were excommunicating him. So when you have all of this happening, tension that already exists, a bishop ends up dying because of the wounds that were inflicted on him by the guards that were manhandling him. Um, uh, churches that are already in conflict with one another. All of this leads to a certain level of like, it, everything climaxes at Chalcedon, when now we have a chance to be able to put Alexandria back in their place. I know this sounds like a movie, and I got to tell you, this is part of what made me love church history, right? And it's, it's anybody who tells you that church history is not tainted with issues, no, of course it is. And, and the beauty is not that it's, the beauty of the church and of the faith is not that we're, <laughs> is that somehow that we don't have these flaws. No, on the contrary. It's the fact that God is still capable of working with a very broken humanity, even those that are in the church. So when I speak of that history and everything that climaxed into Chalcedon, that's what I am speaking of. All of that led to finally the Oscars being put on trial for something he did not do. That is so helpful, I think, to understand, you know, quite simply, the context of church history. Because for so many of us, if we were lucky enough to take a church history class, it, it might have been one or two, right? And it, they're trying to cover, I, I don't fault the church history teachers, they're trying to cover a thousand years and 16 weeks of a class. And so you kind of, you get two paragraphs on Chalcedon and what happened there or something. You right. can't go into this level of nuance. But I think for that same reason, it ends up feeling dry to some people, right? That the story of church history is just this person said this and this person said this and yada, yada. But when we look into it, it is messy. But that's also what makes it exciting. And like you said, to see God work through that. I also think we have this picture of church councils that, that look maybe like the icons and everyone's got their kind of saint halos and they're all sitting around just discussing theology. And uh, if you read the minutes, like you said, uh, you're going to get a different picture. Not to say that there weren't sure. saints present there, um, but these are things that happened in history and times and places and got messy. So thanks for all of that. I I encourage people to check out some of the books you recommended. I, I'm going to personally because this is something that excites me and interests me. Now, I want to turn the corner a little bit 
to where we are now today. So we've, we've taken this kind of, it, you know, somewhat deep dive into the history of Chalcedon, or at least enough to whet the appetite of people that want to look into it more. But now we have the benefit of perhaps a bit of time and cooler heads prevailing and getting to reflect on these things. And from what I understand, there's been lots of ecumenical work done to get to the point where you can say, like, yeah, we hold the same faith. And I believe there's even been uh, official dialogues to, to promote that. And, and you can let me know if I have that correctly. Um, but with that in mind, you said you're hopeful for kind of a reunion of the churches. Do, do you see that as possible? And maybe, obviously, you know, there's a lot that goes into something like that. But um, is that something that people could reasonably hope for, you think? I definitely think so, especially when we speak of, you know, a union that can exist, one that's first based on love between the people. I, I don't know how easily this is going to come down as a change, you know, from the top down. I think a lot of this level of reconciliation is going to first happen from the bottom so that we can inspire our hierarchs to recognize that there, there's hope here. You know, that when you speak of attempts of reconciliation, there's been multiple, multiple attempts at this, especially in the last, I want to say, you know, maybe 60, 70 years. Uh, we met in Denmark in 1964 to try to be able to resolve these things. England in 67, Switzerland in the year 70. Uh, in Geneva in 1990, that was, there was something really beautiful that happened there. As a matter of fact, all of the churches that gathered together, the Eastern churches as well as the Oriental church, and here was specifically that council or that gathering in Geneva, that ecumenical um, gathering was specifically with the Oriental churches as well as the Eastern churches. Um, and there was so much dialogue and it was very focused specifically on the theology. One of the things that came out of that, and I still have, I pulled it out here because I have one of the original photocopies of those signed documents with the signatures of every single representative. Every church signed off on this. Let me read to you this passage if I may. And I think it's really beautiful because it can give us some hope. It says the following, in the light of our agreed statement on Christology, as well as the above common affirmations, we have now clearly understood that both families have always loyally maintained the same authentic Orthodox Christological faith and the unbroken continuity of the apostolic tradition, though they may have used Christological terms in different ways. It is this common faith and continuous loyalty to the apostolic tradition that should be the basis of our unity and our communion. So this is 1990. This was taken, signed by all the representatives, sent back to all the hierarchs. The Oriental churches got really excited. Some of the, some of the people on both ends, not just on the Eastern side, um, on both ends, those who are a little bit more traditional in their ways of thinking, who could not get past the anathemas, who could not get past the tensions and even the bloodshed that happened uh, because of those times of conflict, they basically said anybody who signed this is, you know, out of their minds and they're misreading this and this is... So th that's always going to happen and those voices are always going to exist. But I'll tell you something that I think, you know, at, at, at the grassroots level, I think it's really beautiful to see, for instance, you know, when two priests from the same city, you know, a, a Coptic priest, and a Greek priest, um, a Russian priest, and an Armenian priest are capable of meeting together, praying with each other, telling each other, we recognize that your church is an apostolic church filled with the Lord's grace. I recognize your mysteries. I recognize your baptisms. When this happens at this level, and if we've also seen it between some of our bishops and metropolitans, where they extend to each other that level of graciousness and generosity, when we see this happening more and more, and it is happening more and more, there's so much hope. There's so much hope that eventually our union will first be a union of love before it's a union where we sign off on the paperwork and say that, you know, we remove all the anathemas. We can definitely hope. And I think I think there's something to be hopeful there about, for sure. I am very encouraged by hearing that because I often have kind of waded into the conversation of the, the East and the West, the Eastern Orthodox and, and Roman Catholic Church. And despite maybe a uh, some some goodwill there at, at the grassroots level there's there's not a lot of hope yeah i just recorded an, 
an episode on on the filioque way and the schism and a thousand years later it, it, there's it doesn't look like things are, are budging much but this is encouraging to hear that at least with between the, the Coptic Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox or the Oriental Orthodox churches and the Eastern Orthodox churches that there's some some warming relations there and th- that encourages me and I hope it encourages people listening at so it's, it's not quite at the official level yet, um, but I'm, I'm curious maybe at the pastoral level and if this is controversial and you'd prefer, you know, to say that, you know, isn't figured out yet, that's fine. But I, I imagine that the Coptic Orthodox Church is rather small in the U.S. and Canada probably as well. And if there's someone who's Coptic Orthodox, but they live in a city that doesn't have any Coptic Orthodox churches within driving distance, is like the pastoral recommendation to go to an Eastern Orthodox church or are the relationships not quite warm enough for something like that at this point? 100%. That's exactly what happens. If, if we have any of our, of our congregation members who move out to an area where there is no, uh, there is no Coptic Orthodox church and there is no Oriental Orthodox church, we naturally tell them, please go find an Eastern Orthodox church if you can. Um, what we encourage them to do is to make themselves known you know, to the leader of the parish, the father, the priest that is there, to let them know that they are a Coptic Orthodox Church and to let them know that it was recommended to them by their own parish priest to go attend there. Now, we've seen both reactions. And what's beautiful is that in both cases, they were still very, very welcome and received with a tremendous amount of, you know, of love. Um, We've seen cases where the priest says, by all means, come attend with us. And when they see that the person is very serious in their attendance, they even welcome them to participate in the Eucharist, which is the ultimate sign of love and communion, right? Um, we've also seen the other reaction where it's like, you're welcome to attend, pray with us, be with us. Um, but unfortunately, I can't give you communion because our churches are not in communion. That's usually a decision that is made by the bishop of that diocese. In both cases, our natural inclination is to say, it's not because this is not your home church, that this is not the expression that you are used to, that, that somehow translates into you won't find the grace of God there. You need to go. Liturgy still can transform you, even if it's not your local expression. And we need to absolutely push people to have that life and that connection with the church. So we always do that. The same way that I'll speak to you from personal experience, if someone from the Eastern Church um, used to once upon a time live in an area where they grew up in the Oriental, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, And they're so used to now the idea of, you know, attending a Coptic church because that was the circumstances they were in for the last five, six years in a remote area in the Middle East where there was no Eastern Orthodox churches. When they come and move to Ottawa and they say, can I continue attending here? Of course, of course, because we believe in one baptism. We believe in one faith. We believe in the fact that we are one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And we, we can only hope that that's going to be what's going to drive further unity at that level, that pastoral level that you speak of. That's wonderful, and that's encouraging for me to hear, and I appreciate uh, you sharing kind of both reactions, but also kind of the pastoral wisdom that's given in those situations. It, again, it's encouraging for me to hear something like that, so thanks thanks for sharing that, and I, I know that wasn't on the outline, so uh, hopefully that, that wasn't something that was sprung on you there, but my curiosity was piqued as we went. Well, I, I want to kind of... Uh, continue to explore the more modern day expression of the Coptic Orthodox faith, specifically through this question of now that maybe relationships are warming and now that we live in a more globalized society where things like this can happen, where I can be on a call with you and you know talk about Coptic Orthodoxy from someone that had never even known Coptic Orthodoxy was a thing until probably two years ago or something like that. Right. You know, it, it's a world where there's so much more overlap and people from all across the world are settling in cities like Chicago or Ottawa and are beginning to get to know one another in person or through the internet like this. And so what is it that you think the Coptic Orthodox Church can specifically uh, speak to our modern Christian uh, communities who are trying to make sense of life in the world today? I I think there's a lot the Coptic Orthodox Church has to offer from our phone call, but I'd love for you to share it here. Okay, so I'm going to say this as best as I can, and I promise I'm not trying to be sarcastic, okay? But 
there is something that I think that the Coptic Orthodox Church that can offer the rest of the world um, that really comes from our pain points. It comes from our suffering. In 2015, not so long ago, the world witnessed uh, what would happen to you if you were a Christian in the Middle East, especially if you remember what happened in 2015, 21 young men from you know, the Coptic Orthodox faith were slaughtered on the beaches of Libya, right? And ISIS recorded everything and you saw their beheading and people were absolutely horrified by what they saw, uh, and, and rightly so, because it's completely inhumane. Uh, it's animalistic what was done, and those people were slaughtered for no good reason other than the fact that they confessed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you would think that you were watching something that happened at the time of Diocletian in the 3rd and 4th century, right? But here we are, 21st century, 2015, and this stuff is still going on. And while the rest of the world was horrified, for the Coptic believer who was born and raised in Egypt, this is not a shocking. There's still the pain, there's still the tears, there's still the horror of witnessing what's going on. But unfortunately, this is something that we grew up hearing about and seeing. Every person has a family member in Egypt. Everyone has a family member that was at some point in time was caused to suffer either physically or economically or just through, you know, persecution and prejudice because of the fact that, you know, they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when we when we thank God and we say we thank you for everything, concerning everything and in everything, the Coptic, the Coptic believer really means it. There is no comfort in being a Christian uh, when you're uh, when you're a persecuted minority. Why is it that I'm saying that? I need you to compare that to the current movement of, you know, hashtag blessed. <laughs> There's a really big like chasm that exists there, you know, the gospel of prosperity or health and wealth or in the Western mind of, you know, the typical Christian that might grow up here in North America, where I think that, you know, God wants me to be comfortable and God wants me to be successful and God wants, that is the furthest thing from the mind of the Coptic believer who, you know, he sends his kids away to go to school and he prays to God that they come back home safely. That is, that is a very different reality, right? At some point, um, just a few years ago, there was a bombing on Palm Sunday in one of our great churches. Um, and, you know, in the middle of the liturgy, the bomb was strategically placed exactly where the choir of the deacons gather uh, to be able to sing their, their, their praises. And when the bomb went off, you know, um, several people, several people died and, you know, hundreds more were injured. And the very next day, the church was packed. The very next day in those areas, neighboring churches, it, it was packed as if it was like Easter liturgy. You would think that people would stay home and be like, I'm afraid, or they're just like lay low until things pass and there's loosely tension. And the mindset of the Coptic believer, this is exactly what it means to witness. It's no longer just this idea of standing on the corner of the streets and passing out tracts and trying to encourage people by telling them God bless you or just trying to be nice and you know sharing with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Now it becomes this is what it means to actually witness. And what's interesting is that in the Coptic church, because so much of the Coptic language is founded also in Greek, the word for witness is maktigeia, where we get the word martyr, right? The real witness is the witness where you are willing to lay your life down. And so that still exists in the world today. And I think that the Coptic Church has a really huge, and I know that people, people might not understand what I mean by this, but there is a great blessing in the fact that we are a church that suffered persecution for a very long time. Persecution keeps you on your toes. Persecution keeps you connected to the God that you believe in in a way that is not just superficial. You don't trust in government authorities to defend you. You don't trust in some sort of justice system. You don't trust in insurance. All you have is God, right? So you take every breath thanking him for what you do have, and you put your hope in him and in nothing else. This, this very clearly affects the mindset of the Christian believer. So ultimately, I think what I'm sharing with you, Austin, is that what does the Coptic Orthodox Church have to offer? Well, it has to offer that idea of being truly thankful and faithful in everything, concerning everything, and for all things, regardless of what comes. And I think for those of us who got a little bit too comfortable with our ideas of what it means to be, you know, a North American young man or woman, a North American parent, 
people who live with the security of what we call democracy, um, we fail to realize that the government is on his shoulders. Our trust is in not is not in anything or anyone else or any other worldly system. Our trust is in him alone. And I think the Coptic Church can help remind people of that. So I, I'd probably say that's what uh, I think would be a good benchmark. Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. That that blessed me. That you know, it's a, it's not often that I can kind of step back from all the thoughts that are going on in my head in terms of what are the next questions I need to ask and is the lighting okay as the video paused and all of that. But but occasionally in interviews things kind of pierce through and that was just beautiful. So thank you so much for that, Father Anthony. I, I'm really excited for people to get to, to hear that and, and to ponder really what it is that um, Christianity has often become in the West that in such a way that for us, the word to witness is not linked <laughs> to martyr, at least in our minds, even if you know we have that etymological link that you bring up there. And for us, so often the, the gospel is about raising your kids to be nice people and hopefully they get into a good college and you know don't become delinquents and I guess that's that's a success and <laughs> I'm not a parent that I'm sure that is no small success but um, recognizing that there's so much that a church that's gone through persecution and continues to go through persecution can teach us about what it really means to live out the gospel so thank you very much for that I, I think it would be wise uh, to, to wrap up there, or perhaps I should say it more strongly that it would be foolish for me to, to try to uh, take you down any other road. So as we kind of conclude, I, I do want to give you an opportunity um, just to let people know, like, if, if they walk away from this and they didn't maybe know anything about the Coptic Church, or maybe they thought they knew things and it's changed or whatever, for whatever reason they're now intrigued, what would you recommend if they want to learn more about the Coptic Orthodox Church? The Coptic Orthodox Church, especially here in North America, if you have the chance to be able to, you know, do a quick Google search and find out what churches are near you, uh, very, very welcome and warm and loving people. Um, and I, I would invite you to, first and foremost, to try to take the chance to be able to, to pray about what, why it is that you want to know what's happening in the Coptic Orthodox Church. And if the Lord leads you to be able to knock on a church's door, and to say, I want to attend the Vespers, I want to attend the Bible study, I want to attend the youth group, um, you will be very, very, very welcomed. And I think what's most important is um, the purpose behind a lot of Coptic Orthodox churches is not to win people over. We're not trying to fill the pews. Uh, remember, you're speaking to a group of people where, you know, <laughs> preaching the gospel in our own country is illegal and you can, you know, end up in prison or even killed for it. So the purpose is not to fill the church pews, the purpose is to shine a light if you want to see a different expression of what the ancient church, the early church, used to look like, we held on to that. And I think it's really beautiful to be able to get that flavor, to get a sense of, you know, how do I compare? And I think, Austin, you touched on this, um, to be able to, to be able to say, you know, is, are there different expressions um, of what Christianity might look like? And what is one that might look like the earliest expressions would have looked like? I think you'll find that in the Coptic Orthodox Church. So I invite you to take a look. That's wonderful. And yeah, it's a blessing that in our modern times, it's as simple as going on Google and seeing what's closest to you there. So uh, I, I imagine there will be people doing that um, after this video, and I hope it's a wonderful experience for them. Well, I want to close, as I always do, uh, with what I call the final four here on the channel. And they're kind of rapid fire questions, just to get to know the guests a little bit more on a bit more personal level, since a lot of the conversations tend to be a bit academic. And the first question that I ask all my guests is, what is the most fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? Uh, divine liturgy. I would not be able to live without the Eucharist. Love it. All right. Outside the Bible, what has been the most impactful book on your life? On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. It took me forever to read it, but once I read it, it ruined me in the most beautiful ways. So... That's a great one. That was the first patristic text I think I ever read. Um, Same here. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we've got that in common. All right. So you're having coffee with yourself right after deciding to become a priest. What's one piece of advice you give him for his future in ministry? It's not about you. You have to learn to disappear so that Christ can make himself more visible to those that you serve. Wonderful.
wonderful. And the final question is, this channel is called Gospel Simplicity, but often our conversations get a bit complex here. And so people wonder, well, where is the simplicity in all of this? Should it be called Gospel Complexity? It's not happening, people. It's not happening. The channel is remaining Gospel Simplicity. But uh, I, I love getting to ask guests this question. If, if you had to explain what the gospel is in a sentence or so, what would you say? I think the Lord already did that. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Everything that we do is an expression that traces back to those two things. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Maybe our expressions are complicated, but the foundations are very simple. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. There is the simplicity for all of you. Thank you for that, Father Anthony. And thank you for your time today. This has been a joy. I also want to say preemptively, thank you for all of your time watching this, whoever you are watching this sometime in the future. I don't take that lightly. And if you've made it this far, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your support. I will close by saying uh, what I always say. Of, until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. But far more important than that, go out and love God and love others, because truly above all else, that will change the world. Thank you.